The atheist is without excuse. I don't owe you an explanation. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Well, creationists are out here saying some stupid things and making nonsense arguments? Boy, must be a day ending in why. Yes, we are back again, cats and kittens, with another round of creationist cringe. With so many people of faith assembling their asinine attempts at accurate analysis and argumentation down to a little minute or less tidbit, it becomes easier to curate the craziness into compilation form. And that's what we're going to be doing today, taking some of the most recently discovered dipshittery and distilling it down for easier debunking. But before we get to that, if you end up liking what you see on this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. Check out my social media, including my Patreon and Twitter, all linked in the description. And of course, like this particular video, maybe pop in a comment. All that goes a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm. All glory to the digital hypnotoad. The hypnotoad. All glory to the hypnotoad. And keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. The atheist is without excuse because every morning the sun rises and every evening the sun sets and it has never failed in his lifetime. So this short is titled, as I'm sure comes as no surprise, Atheism Debunked. This sort of thing is what many believers think constitutes good evidence for the existence of God and specifically debunks atheism. So the first point is the blatant misunderstanding of atheism and what it means to debunk it. Because since atheism is not believing in God, the only way to debunk that would be to prove that no one doesn't believe in God. Which is something many an apologist has attempted to argue in the past. But proving God exists wouldn't even debunk atheism so long as there are still people who don't agree with that evidence and still don't believe in God. Then atheism people not believing in God, would still exist and therefore not be debunked. But let's leave that aside and go after what this guy is actually arguing. Atheism is debunked because the sun rises and sets, is what he's saying. Well, unless he's a flat earther, something I wouldn't put past him because virtually all flat earthers are religious as well, I mean, it's hard to put forth the notion of a magic ball of fire floating above a flat plane without falling to the ground unless you're invoking a magical deity that's keeping it in place. Now, I hope he was just using the idea of rising and setting sun colloquially, because, of course, the sun doesn't move relative to us. We move relative to it. It seems to rise and set because our planet is spinning on its axis. And why has that never failed to happen in our lifetimes? Well, because of Newton's first law of motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So our planet is the object in this case, and it is spinning on its axis. That is the motion in question. That is why the sun appears to rise and set. And that motion is constant because there is no competing unbalanced force acting upon the spin of the Earth that would overcome its inertia and its consistent movement. At least, not in any way that we've been able to perceive for most of the existence of our species. For thousands of years, the Earth has been generally slowing down, with the rate varying from time to time. The slowing is mostly caused by the effect of tides, which are caused by the pull of the Moon. This didn't matter until atomic clocks were adopted as the official time standard more than 55 years ago, because those didn't slow. That established two versions of time, astronomical and atomic, and they didn't match. Astronomical time fell behind atomic time by 2.5 milliseconds every day. That meant the atomic clock would say it's midnight, and to Earth it was midnight a fraction of a second later. So the spin of the Earth is changing and therefore would eventually result in the rising and setting of the Sun taking place at different times than one would expect if the slowing of the spin wasn't happening, and even more eventually, end altogether. 
It just takes so long for this to happen that any significant change takes far, far longer than a single human lifespan. But this is an example of Newton's second law of motion. An object acted upon by a force will accelerate in the direction of the force. The force of the other gravitational influences, like the moon, is changing the consistent motion of the planet. Those outside forces are just not strong enough to completely overpower the inertial motion that the planet already has. It just changes it slightly. So, the movement of celestial bodies within our solar system is perfectly in keeping with basic laws of physics pertaining to motion. That things work exactly the way that they've been observed to work throughout history is not miraculous. It's what one would expect. So it's hard to use that as proof of God's existence. Now, if the sunrise and sunset suddenly and radically changed, say, cutting the length of a day from 24 hours down to 12, speeding up the rotation of the Earth to twice as fast as it currently is, with no apparent cause for this, and, even more miraculously, that massive change didn't result in the catastrophic destruction of our planet as we know it, that sort of thing would be a miracle that would be much greater evidence for the existence of some kind of massively or all-powerful being behind it. But things working today, the same way they worked yesterday, and all the days before that, for as long as we've been keeping track of such things? Yeah, no, that's not miraculous. It's commonplace. Now, one could posit that the laws of physics being what they are are evidence of a creator god, and many have attempted that argument as well. Because why do things work the way that they do if they weren't set that way by a god? But that is just a basic argument from incredulity, concluding that because you can't or refuse to believe something, it must not be true, improbable, or the argument must be flawed. This is a specific form of the argument from ignorance. Because you can't or won't accept that the laws of physics could be naturally occurring, you supplant the idea of a magical creator god instead and think that your refusal to accept a naturalistic reason is an argument in and of itself in favor of your supernaturalistic reasoning. But it isn't. So what else do we have from the theistic side of the aisle? Do you believe well, atheists can get married? I think atheists get married because they want a tax break. I don't see the point in an atheist getting married. Why don't you just live with your partner, okay? Wh whoever it is that you're dating, you're at the stage you said, I don't know if you live with your boyfriend or whatever it is, why take the next leap? If you're wearing crosses for fun and, you know... Well, it I mean, seems if like you're, you're actually you're, you're, asking yeah, the question, yeah. I mean, because then I would just be pledging the fact that I would want to be with them forever. But I don't you, can, really... you can just be with them forever. So why, what is it right, that you but... crave that when you, when you want to get married? What's that next step for you? What does it mean? What's the difference between it's dating and marriage? Because it's a commitment. Is dating not a commitment? <laughs> it's a commitment, but it's saying a but next you're in step. The, in, it's within, solidifying it. Okay, solidifying what? Because if solidifying you're, if a you, bond between two people that love each other. Okay, but it, but what is solidified? If you can then jump into that next commitment, which is the exact same as dating, and you can sleep with other people, and you can put topless photos on the internet, what are you getting married for? Pictures on Instagrams to say you did it? Oh look, it's Candace Owens saying stupid things. You know what I just got done talking about, with the same thing happening day after day being natural and to be expected? Kind of like horse shit coming out of this person's mouth on a daily basis? You got anything to say? I hate my noir. So Candace is saying that she doesn't understand why atheists get married. I mean, after all, marriage without God is no different than dating, right? I mean, like she said, the only practical, non-spiritual reason to get married is the tax incentives, right? Nothing else beyond that changes when people get married. Except a lot of things change in terms of legal classification, status, and benefits. Yes, there's the opportunity to file income taxes jointly, but a host of other things come with marriage as well. Sponsoring their husband or wife for immigration benefits have joint parenting rights such as access to children's school records, have next of kin status for emergency medical decisions, have family visitation rights such as a visit to a spouse in a hospital or prison, receive custodial rights to children, shared property, child support, and alimony after divorce, qualify for certain domestic violence interventions, receive spousal funeral and bereavement leave, inherit property, 
Receive spousal benefits when an officer is killed in the line of duty. Receive spousal social security payments. Have immunity from testifying against spouses in a court of law. Apply for housing assistance if in a low-income family. Apply for copyright renewal for works created by their deceased spouse. Received spousal recognition for policies governing burial at Arlington National Cemetery. And this is not an exhaustive list of all the differences for married versus unmarried couples in our society. It's just a few. Marriage is a massive change from single status that impacts one's life with their significant other in countless practical ways. So, not getting married when one is committed to their romantic partner, with intention to stay with them for the rest of their life, is far more impractical than just going ahead and doing it. Even if that means they don't want to have a big ceremony, make a big deal out of it, and they just go down to the county courthouse and sign the necessary paperwork to make it official. That is a much better idea than attempting to stay single and just cohabitate for the rest of their lives. Beyond the social and legal benefits, most people tend to get married, as the people around the table with Candace indicated, because it's more of a permanent and official commitment than just dating. Candace responds by saying that dating is a commitment too. It's just the same as marriage, right? Did you eat a lot of paint chips when you were a kid? <laughs> Why? Since when is dating the same as marriage as long as you take the God stuff out of it? Is dating a commitment that is supposed to last for life? No. Marriage is supposed to last for life. At least that's the general idea. No one goes into a marriage with the intention of eventually divorcing. Is dating a commitment to share one's home, finances, possessions, children, inheritance, their lows as well as their highs, their sickness and health, for richer or poorer, etc., etc.? No, absolutely not. Dating is nothing more than a romantic entanglement that lasts exactly as long as both parties are amenable to it, and only entails the sharing of what both parties are amenable to sharing. Even people who are opposed to being legally married will often still have some kind of a ceremony where they commit themselves to one another in front of friends and family, and will from then on refer to themselves as married, or as spouses, husband, wife, etc., but just never making it legally official. And if you want to do that, if you want to be with that person for the rest of your life and are not opposed to being legally married, and then given all the practical benefits of legal marriage, why would an atheist who wants to commit themselves to their romantic partner for life not get married? That's what makes no sense, Candace. What else from the old creationist grab bag of stupid? This is, again, where we're going to conflict with our culture because they're going to be mm -hmm. like, if you don't approve of this behavior, I'm going to hate you. I think that you're judgmental and you're weird and rude and angry and you're a horrible person. <laughs> like this is, this is the current reaction. And the response is, the question isn't whether I approve of it. The question is whether God approves of it and then whether I want to submit to God's approval or not. And when you make it, it's not about me and you. This is about the creator of the universe and how he said he wants us to live. It's possible that we love things that he hates. We should pay attention to that. Fuck you. Fuck, you. Fuck you! So Mike Winger, engaging in homophobia, perhaps transphobia, gaslighting, Christian persecution complex, and imposing theistic rationalization to excuse bigotry, all in under 30 seconds. It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> all right, for starters, Saying that this isn't about you and me, but it's about what God thinks and wants and has commanded, well, I don't believe your God exists. So that argument isn't going to get us anywhere, and that isn't going to get you anywhere with anyone who doesn't believe in your specific God. Even other theists, even other Christians, don't accept your position on the matter, too. Pew Research's religious landscape study was done in 2007 and then again in 2014, so it's really due for another round soon, but it saw dramatic changes in acceptance of homosexuality across all Christian denominations in just an eight-year period. And not just with the general belief that society should accept, as in not persecute homosexuals, but even in terms of whether or not they believe that homosexuality is even a sin. With total numbers of Christians believing homosexuality to be a sin roughly equaling those who don't back in 2014. 
And that was 10 years ago. With general trends in terms of the social progression of Western Christianity, it's likely those numbers have changed to be even more accepting of homosexuality today. And more than half of all Christians disagreeing with you, Mike, about what God thinks about homosexuality. So even most of those on your side of the theistic aisle would be in disagreement with you. But also, to gaslight the LGBTQ community and shove in some stock-and-trade Christian persecution complex by saying that LGBTQ people are hating you for simply following your faith, as if you're the one under fire in this whole situation, as if you are the one being marginalized and under attack, well, that's just ridiculous and, frankly, offensive. When it comes to LGBTQ people being mad at those who have a problem with them, well, it's put well by gender theorist Kate Bornstein, who said, We are entitled to our anger in response to this oppression. Our anger is a message to ourselves that we need to get active and change something in order to survive. When your Christian adherence to what you believe about homosexuality includes the wielding of political power in order to restrict, curtail, or outright deny civil rights to an already socially marginalized group, you don't get to claim umbrage when people of that group and their allies dislike you for it. You don't get to say to an entire demographic of people that, hey, God hates what you are. Now, that's not me saying it, that's God. I'm just repeating it, agreeing with it, normalizing it, and pushing for it to be the accepted standard of all of society. And then get upset when the very people you are attacking give you the big, fat, metaphorical finger? Uh-uh. Well, hey, don't make this about you and me. This is about God and what he wants. Well, I don't believe your God exists. Most of the people on the planet don't believe that the God you believe in exists. Even among your own faith, most people don't believe the things you believe about your God. And if you are right, if your God does exist and he does hate homosexuality as you think he does, then your God is a bigot and is not worthy of worship. You are choosing to worship hate. That is your choice. That is you accepting and condoning hate. You don't get to pass the buck off to God to try to absolve yourself of responsibility for it. This is about you and me. This is about you and us. This is you being a person who accepts, condones, and agrees with hate. Well, I'd love to stay in chat, but you're a total bitch. Another one from the unending depths of theistic stupidity. How do you kill two major atheist arguments with just one move? You're about to find out. In his paper, The Limits of Divine Love, philosopher Jeff Jordan argues that God's love is variable across persons. God loves some persons more than others. The hiddenness argument assumes that if God loves all persons, he'd be open to a relationship with all persons. The evidential problem of evil is often defended using what's called the loving parent analogy. If God's perfectly loving, then God would make his loving presence known to those who are suffering. If, as Jordan argues, God loves some persons more than others, then there's no reason to expect, as divine hiddenness does, that God will be open to a relationship with all persons at all times. And there's no reason to expect, as the problem of evil does, that God will make sure all people are aware of his loving presence. Thus, if God's love is partial and variable, then key premises in the arguments from hiddenness and evil are false, the arguments are unsound. Okay, let's dig into this steamy pile of garbage. For starters, the problem of evil and the notion that God should be equally accessible to everyone are not arguments for the idea of God not existing at all. They are both arguments against specific conceptions of God. The problem of evil, for instance, is an argument against a tri-omni-god. That is a god that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. Because if God is all three of those things, then there can be no justification for the existence of evil or suffering in the world. If suffering exists, then any kind of god that exists is either unable to prevent it, thus not omnipotent, doesn't know how to effectively prevent it, thus not omniscient, or doesn't care to prevent it, thus not omnibenevolent. 
So if you're arguing for the existence of God that doesn't love everyone, then sure, this argument doesn't work. But it's not aimed at that kind of a God, is it? I mean, for instance, the problem of evil wouldn't do anything to dispel the notion of, say, the ancient Greek gods who regularly seemed to visit horrors and suffering on people who displeased them, or whom they simply didn't like, like the story of Medusa, who got transformed into a monster by Athena for the horrid offense of Poseidon, the god of the sea, forcing himself on her in Athena's temple. What exactly did she do wrong there? It's not like she could have stopped the god of the sea from doing that to her, but that was an offense to Athena, and she gets turned into a monster as a result. Hell, plenty of God concepts throughout human history have had no problem inflicting great evil and suffering on humanity. So the problem of evil is not, and never has been, an argument against any and all God concepts, but specifically against any God concept that proposes an all-loving God capable of eliminating suffering and yet refusing to do so. So if you're wanting to rewrite the typical monotheistic idea of God in a way that invalidates the Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and basically every monotheistic religion's belief in God, then go nuts, my friend. But you have to recognize that you are no longer talking about the God of any of the world's major religions, and you're now on the same theistic footing as someone arguing for Xenu dumping frozen aliens into volcanoes in order to maintain his galactic empire. And it's the same with the idea of God being equally accessible to everyone. Again, this is specifically a refutation of any God concept that includes the God being all-loving. It doesn't debunk beliefs in Thor, or Kalima, or Set, or any of the many proposed gods who didn't care about entire swaths of people. So again, if you're proposing a God who doesn't love all of humanity, then sure, that argument doesn't debunk the God you're talking about. But you have to recognize that you are no longer talking about the God of any of the world's major monotheistic religions. You certainly aren't talking about the Christian God as described in the Bible. From 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, if you want to interpret that as not applying to everyone, I suppose you can. But again, you need to recognize that in doing so, you are going against the common interpretation of that and many other passages in the Bible that the faith has interpreted as clear indication of the Christian God's love for everyone. So this attempt to insist that God doesn't love everyone and wants bad things to happen, it's not killing of two atheist arguments. It's actually helping along those arguments that stand in opposition to the idea of an all-loving God. So you're actually helping atheists when we attempt to argue against the major religions that believe in such an omnibenevolent being. And if your conception of God that you believe in is one of a being who likes it when bad things and suffering befalls people, and intentionally refuses to engage in a personal relationship with many of his creations, thus leaving them with no recourse than to become atheists when they seek and don't find, thereby condemning them to an eternal hellfire because he couldn't be bothered to make himself known to them? Then you worship an asshole. Wait, we, we've got another one still to watch? Why? What have I done to deserve this? Do you know why hell exists? Hell was created for the devil and the fallen angels because they rebelled against God in heaven. Why then do people go to hell? People go to hell simply because they choose to reject God. If you choose to reject God, you are simply aligning yourself with the devil. And if you align yourself with the devil, you go to hell. How then can you avoid going to hell? Believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, and follow their commands. Type I believe in Jesus in the comments and subscribe for more. What kind of sense does that make? Not believing in God is aligning yourself with the devil? But 
the devil believes in God. The devil is not an atheist. Now, certainly the Judeo-Christian conception of the devil does reject the commandments of God and the teachings of Jesus and the like, but that's most certainly not the same thing as not believing that God exists. Most non-believers still engage in what are considered pro-social behaviors. Pro-social behaviors refer to actions that are intended to help others without expecting anything in return. These behaviors can be motivated by empathy, moral values, or a desire for social approval. They can be spontaneous or deliberate, and they often enhance the well-being of both the giver and the receiver. With examples such as sharing toys or donating blood, helping out others, loving one's neighbor as themselves, not stealing, not killing, not harming. The same sorts of things that, you know, Jesus talked about. The same sorts of things that any Abrahamic religion teaches. Now, non-believers engage in these sorts of pro-social behaviors for completely secular reasons, such as abiding by secular humanism or other non-theistic moral frameworks, or believing in the advancement of the species and human society and seeing pro-social behaviors as the best way to accomplish that, or just general empathizing with others, motivating acts of kindness. So, in this way, atheists who reject God are only rejecting the belief in the being. They're not rejecting ethics or moral frameworks advocated by the religions built around the belief in that being. Also, allying with someone is a conscious choice. It's not a default. I mean, if I reject American nationalism, that does not make me a Russian defector by default. If I reject capitalism, that does not make me a communist by default. If I don't like Marvel Comics, that doesn't make me a DC fanboy by default. And if I don't believe in the existence of the Judeo-Christian God, that doesn't make me an ally of the devil by default. And another thing, if hell was created by an all-powerful God as a specific place to imprison the devil and his demons, and it was never intended by God that humans should ever go there, then that causes serious problems for your conception of God. I mean, isn't the God you believe in all-knowing? So how did he not know that some humans would reject him eventually and thus end up in hell? Your God must not be all-knowing then. And if he is all-powerful, such that he can create an entire realm, an entire separate dimension to place the devil and all his demons, then when humans started not believing in him, why couldn't he have made a different place, not hell, to send non-believers? Which, by the way, happened right from the start. The earliest humans didn't believe in the Abrahamic God. The Abrahamic religions that position Yahweh as the highest of all gods didn't begin until around 1400 BCE, with some accounts pushing it back a bit further to maybe the 20th century BCE. So, at best, 4,000 years ago. Well, Homo sapiens appeared between 200 and 300,000 years ago. So, assuming you aren't a young earth creationist, and you may be, but that's a whole other level of bullshit we won't get into today, that means that 100% of humanity, for as long as 296,000 years, were not believing in Yahweh and thus going to hell. And God didn't do anything about this? Didn't build a new place for them to hang out that wasn't fire and brimstone? Especially considering they didn't do anything wrong? What, asleep on the job, was he? So, that's all the creationist cringe I can stomach for one day. We had believe in God because nothing is stopping the earth from spinning. Marriage makes no sense unless you believe in God and you ignore the dozens or hundreds of secular reasons to get married. Proving God exists by debunking the God that the vast majority of theists believe in. We had God hates the gays and I'm just following God, so don't get mad at me. And you belong in hell because not believing in God automatically makes you an evil bastard by default, regardless of how much good you engage in. Well, all I have to say after sifting through all of that cesspool of sanctimonious septic sludge is... And so that is where we'll end things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. 
Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Don't forget to check out my Twitter and Patreon if you'd like to support my work directly. My Teespring if you want some Plinky merchandise. All that link below in the description. Special shout out to my most recent super thankers here on YouTube, JGS1122 and Salvi Mike. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.